Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Cassandra Fridovich, and I'm the community manager for the South Region. I uh, wanted to welcome you to the session for low vision aids and devices. This session will last about 70 minutes, uh, and the last 20 minutes of the session will be reserved for questions from the audience. Please note, this session is being audio recorded. If you are using an assisted listening device, please turn to channel blinking purple. And don't forget to silence your cell phone. The speaker for this session is Dr. Francisco Richardson. Dr. Francisco Richardson is a distinguished low vision optometrist with a passion for helping others overcome visual challenges. Originally from Puerto Rico, Dr. Richardson's journey is marked by a commitment to service, both in professional endeavors and community. Before we begin, I would like to encourage you to be social with us. You can follow the Visions Conference on Twitter Instagram and Facebook and share your experiences using the conference hashtag visions 2024 and by tagging us in your post at fighting blindness dr. Richardson the floor is yours hello good morning everyone good morning. Good morning. can everyone hear me okay yes. all right well, I want to start off by saying that it is an honor and a privilege to come and speak with you, ladies and gentlemen, today. I also want to point out that um, I am very impressed with the level of knowledge that all of you possess. Um, this conference is packed with very amazing speakers. Many of them are far more intelligent than I am, but I hope that you will enjoy my presentation today. As I took some time to piece together you know, what kind of aids and devices I wanted to speak about, I quickly decided to use a very unique format. Uh, what if I shared with you the scientific process that I use from beginning to end, so that's how I evaluate my patients in my office. Would that be interesting to everyone? So first we will review the categories of low vision aids and devices, and then I will try to paint to you a perspective and visual needs of each one of these patients, and then maybe together we can decide which one of those aids and devices would be appropriate for each case, okay? So the objectives for today are let's learn about the devices, the technologies, and the low vision adaptations for work, home, and education. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. I don't get money from anybody except from my private practice. And I do have my office in Orlando or Winter Park, Florida, if you're familiar with the area. So I like Chicago. Very nice. Second time here. And uh, let's get into it. Uh, so first, let's review the basics. What I consider the basics are those things that we as humans can do every single day to improve our situation the best that we can. And these all sound like very obvious and simple things, but we're human beings and we never do what we're supposed to do, right? So number one for me is faith in God. I'm not here to preach today, but it, it is my talk after all, so I will say that that's number one. Number two, you should have a good relationship with your friends and your family. This is your support network. These are the people that are going to help you in your day-to-day -day life. Number three, I need you to drink more water. Everybody, uh, I think, struggles to drink a little water. We forget that air conditioning dehydrates or removes the moisture from the space and your body, so it is important to drink a lot more water. I clearly remember when I was in the Army, during survival training, they stressed that you can live without food for three weeks, but you can't live without water for three days. So water is kind of the key to life. All right. Number four is your diet. You want to try to have a low caloric intake. You want to concentrate on less processed foods, and you want to eat lots of fruits and veggies covering all the different colors of the spectrum. So your yellows, your oranges, your greens, your whatever. All the colors is what you want to try to accomplish every day. Number five, you want to do some cardio exercise. You want to make sure that you're doing at least 20, 30 minutes, three to four times a week. That will maintain your body in good movement, keep your cardiovascular health strong. You should consider things like biking, walking, running, tennis, pickle, golf. Just make sure you're doing anything with intensity. If you're strolling down the, the, the sidewalk, that's not true exercise. I want you to go and get it, sweat a little bit, earn it, okay? 
Number six, you need to reduce stress. Stress doesn't go away, and stress is not something that we can live without, but you can certainly find tools uh, and different ways to manage that so that the stress doesn't get the better of you, okay? Uh, sleep is number seven. I recommend at least six or seven, hey Dan, how you doing? Six or seven hours of, of sleep every night. Um, it's important, you have to recharge your batteries, okay? And lastly, number eight is sun exposure. We take it for granted, but 30 minutes or 40 minutes of sunlight every day helps with vitamin D, also helps with brain function, uh, and it's very important to have a little bit of sun exposure. That's uh, the creator of life, so we should, we should kind of spend some time out there. So again, these are all common sense, but for some reason we are human beings and we don't do what we have to do. So I just challenge you to try to manage those and, and do the best you can to do those on a daily basis. All right, so let's, now that the basics are out, let's get into it. I have grouped low vision devices into different categories. These are kind of my categories and they're not in any particular order. So we'll just kind of start going through them and I'll try to do it a little bit quickly. You can stop me anytime if anybody has any questions or comments, I want it to be interactive. Active. I want you to get the best you can out of this talk, and I definitely want to, you know, uh, make sure I address all of your questions, concerns, comments, etc. All right, keep in mind that these categories, not in any order, blah, blah, blah. First and foremost, mental health. In my practice, I have noticed that the level of depression runs extremely high, especially with my patients with low vision. And many of these patients are receiving excellent medical care, but they don't understand their medical condition, they don't understand their prognosis, and so I recommend counseling pretty much to all of my patients. Uh, life is challenging enough without having you know vision impairment and you know that really makes things a lot more complicated and difficult so managing stress anxiety those things are important make sure you find a professional if, if you feel like you need some support with that we have to come to terms and accept some of the changes that happen in life and that way you can live a positive and joyful life improved mental health can be achieved by Consistent counseling, you know, you learn tools to manage stress from personal things, from the disabilities, from relationships, from family, from friends. Then there's also support groups. You can share your visual journey, have others share with you and work together to try to collaborate. You can join organizations such as the, found, the, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, an excellent organization that's really looking forward to, to try to resolve a lot of these, especially the IRDs, the, the inherited kind of conditions. One thing I wanted to mention was Charles Bonet. Does anybody here experience Charles Bonet or any weird visual, you know, images that they're not, yeah, a lot of you are raising your hands. This was something that was very interesting to me initially, you know, but the way I, I have had it explained to me and the way I'd like to share it with you is, it's just your brain filling in the gaps. Since there are areas of your vision that are not so, so solid and so good, the brain is so powerful of a computer that it likes to fill in the gaps for you. Unfortunately, those gaps you know, are kind of interesting. They could be weird repeating patterns. It could be colors. Uh, maybe some of you will share those with me at the end, and, and I can use those to educate some of my other patients. Now, how do we deal with, with the Charles Bonnet? So what I've kind of learned and, and seen to be successful is to really change things up in the moment. So for example, if you're, in, if you're in a light place, go dark. If you're in the dark, go light. If it's quiet, add some sound. If it's noisy. So you want to try to change things up on yourself so that it kind of tricks the brain into snapping out of it and, and going back to normal, okay? But just keep in mind, those are not dementia. Those are not anything that you need to be concerned about. They're not hallucinations per se. It's just the brain is powerful and it's filling in some of those gaps. The main reason you tell them apart from dementia and some of these things is that generally your, your, the hallucinations that you're experiencing with vision loss are, are not going to affect you in any kind of a negative way. Usually with dementia, these images or you know, whatever they're seeing actually interacts with them and affects them and causes them to be very anxious and nervous about them. We're, we're, I kind of describe these as watching television, right? It's just something that you see, but it doesn't really affect you in any kind of a way. All right, 
Number two category is surgical. We take for granted sometimes that perhaps we need to do some surgery before we talk about low vision, right? There's things like the, the muscles of the eye that helps keep things aligned. If your two eyes are not pointing in the same place, you're gonna experience double vision, you're gonna have um, other, other kind of issues. So you can certainly do surgery to improve the alignment of the eyes. You can have droopy eyelids that get in the way of your vision. So we can maybe raise those out of the way so that you're able to see a little better. Uh, there's obviously the surface of the eye, the cornea. Some people have corneal replacements or cross-linking procedures. Uh, there's also refractive surgery like LASIK and PRK. You can replace the inside uh, layer of that cornea, uh, the endothelium. That, that's what keeps the cornea kind of clear. So. There's a lot of procedures and surgeries that are available that we need to consider so that I can maximize or give you the best vision that is actually possible. Another one is the cataracts and capsule, especially as we get a little bit older. Cataracts are not necessarily a disease per se, it's just when the natural lens of the eye starts to get blurry. And so if you have a blurry lens inside of the eye, no matter what I put in front of your eyes, it's still gonna be blurry or worse. So getting rid of cataracts or capsular media is also very important. Realize that we have some new lenses available today that are implanted. They can correct astigmatism, they can be multifocal to give you some reading advantage. So there are some new lenses out there available. There's even a mini telescope telescope that can be implanted. Usually it's done in the non-dominant eye so that we would set your dominant eye or your better eye for seeing far away and then we would do the other eye and set it up with a mild teles uh, a little miniature telescope inside the eye so that you can really magnify and get out a little bit further. Then of course we have the optic nerve like glaucoma, filtering surgery, your laser iridotomies, and of course, and most important, probably the retina if you have uh, any issues with the photo paper of the eye. If we compare the eye like a camera, the retina being your photo paper, that's where retinal detachments happen, uh, leaky blood vessels, things like this that need to be addressed and kind of, uh, you know, handled before we can give you the best vision possible. So from the surgery, let's go into nutrition, medications, gene therapy, stem cell, retinal prosthesis, these kind of things. Again, remember the basics we covered earlier. There are some proactive things that we can do to make the, the organism of our body as healthy as possible. Uh, and that way we're doing proactive instead of reactive. When we use medications only, you're really reacting to the symptoms of something that has happened to the body. So we, we wanna try to get things at the starting place, not later down the line with symptoms, okay? Um, uh, un, uh, controlling underlying conditions like your cardiovascular health, your heart, your blood pressure, your diabetes, your thyroid, these things obviously need to be under control as well. Do not forget that up, updates and changes to nutrition, medications, and this category occurs frequently, as you very well know. The research that we've been talking about all these couple days is changing every, every week, every month, every year. So uh, uh, as we talk about things today, maybe next week it's different, but for now, <laughs> I hope that what I'm describing is, is accurate. Um, the next thing is nutrition. I kind of recommend the Mediterranean diet. I like my patients to have a lot of fruits and dark green leafy veggies, colorful veggies, nuts, beans, fish, olive oil, these kind of things. You wanna try to reduce items like butter, your red meats, your dairy, your carbs. I don't believe in cutting things out 100% unless you have to from allergies, but I do believe in having a little bit of variety and keeping things under control. It is absolutely critical to prevent medical errors. If you take the wrong medication because you couldn't see it, that's a problem that we can prevent. Why are we dealing with those things? So does everybody know about Script Talk or something similar to this pro, uh, uh, program? Basically, they, it's a, a free service through your pharmacy. It'll put a special label on your medications. It could be large print. It could be a voice label. It could be in Braille. It can have multiple languages and translations. It can talk about your controlled substances so that you learn special, uh, you know, more information about those and even offer safety videos. So it's, it's very important to prevent errors that are preventable. Let's not have problems that we can prevent. 
Next one is a lot for my RP patients is the N-acetylcysteine, the NAC. I'm sure there's been some talk this weekend about that. I'm not going to get into it too much, but it, it prevents oxidative stress, and it is strongly recommended that patients don't take this on your own. Right now, there's the NAC attack study, and it'll re determine the safety and efficacy. We're not really sure of how long the, the long-term benefits, but we're also not sure of the side effects at this time. So be, be cautious on, on taking things without being monitored by one of your medical professionals. <laughs> And just recently, I was reading about nacamide, NACA, for patients with ushers. Uh, this is a modified form of NAC. It's designed to be more potent and bioavailable, and it's currently in phase two trials right now in Australia. The last one that I want to talk about is the AREDs. Uh, these are the vitamins that have been kind of studied for your macular degeneration patients. Um, one of the things to note on that is that the first study included vitamin A beta, beta carotene, and it was later removed because it was found to affect our patients that smoke and potentially increase the risk for lung cancer. So uh, if you fall into that category of macular de degeneration and I can't convince you to stop smoking, then you need to make sure we don't take vitamin and into vitamin A, okay? Uh, it was later included with lutein and zeaxanthin. These are carotenoids that are shown to slow the progression of macular degeneration up to 25 to 30 percent. That's pretty significant to me. So if you're not taking these and you have macular degeneration, you need to start those. It's, it's kind of the only thing I have for you, all right? Uh, da -da -da -da. Another, another thing to note is that these, these vitamins do not reverse the current damage that you've already experienced. I wish that it would regenerate and, and redo the macula for you, but unfortunately, it's only to prevent the progression uh, from getting worse. Uh, and just to let you know, the, com the components in, in the AREDS formulation is 500 milligrams of vitamin C, 400 uh, international units of E, 2 milligrams of copper, uh, 80 milligrams of zinc, 10 milligrams of lutein, and 2 milligrams of zeaxanthin. Have fun, you know, doing those, yeah. <laughs> so, now, if you don't have macular, you can still consider the lutein and the zeaxanthin. Uh, as I said, these AREDS vitamins do not prevent uh, you uh, getting macular degeneration late, later in life, but the lutein and the zeaxanthin on their own have been shown to help pack the macular pigments a little tighter, and that, you know, will give you a little bit of improved vision as well. So uh, the, those two compounds are found in high levels in parsley, spinach, kale, and egg yolks. Nice. Intravitreal injections have also been a very uh, important uh, addition to, to the arsenal for the retina doctors especially. Initially, it was kind of for wet macular degeneration and for diabetes or vein occlusions. And now recently, they've got a couple medications for the geographic atrophy that comes from the dry kind. So if you do have the dry macular, there are some new advances that can potentially help you to, uh, to decrease the progression of those. For IRDs, or inherited retinal diseases specifically, treatments have been uh, traditionally restricted to counseling and low vision rehabilitation. That's it. But now we have gene therapy, we have stem cells, we have retinal prosthesis. There's some really neat things coming out there that I'm very excited about. Retinal prosthetics, I mean, imagine being able to, to implant a video camera of some sort that communicates with your retina and, and uh, giving you some, some of your vision back. That to me is very impressive. Get some cyborgs walking around. All right. And then, of course, the gene therapy, the stem cells. We've got Luxterna as an example, uh, I think from 2017, if that's correct. But if you have uh, trouble with both copies of your RPE 65 and you have maybe four or $500,000 per eye, then perhaps we can have you know, some support with that. All right. The next category is going to be driving. Now, many of my patients, unfortunately, don't have the vision to drive, but it's interesting that low vision just means when you don't see, like, 
traditional person all the way up to doesn't see anything at all, which leaves an incredibly large margin of, of vision. And that's what actually makes my, hard the, my, my, my job the hardest, because there's not one device that I can give any one of my patients that's successful. I have to sit down and I have to listen very carefully, not only to what's happening with your eyes, but what your visual needs are, so that I can really make the best recommendations possible. But something that almost all of my patients want is to continue driving. Not all the states allow you to use low vision aids to drive. So since I'm from Florida, I'm not prepared to, to discuss things about Illinois, but I would just say make sure you speak with your, your professional, your low vision optometrist or doctors about the state requirements in your area. But basically, if you are allowed to use devices for driving, we're mainly talking about bioptic telescopes. That's kind of the main one that's used. It's a little telescope that's mounted a little bit high on your glasses. And so when you're looking through your glasses normal, you have your normal vision. But when you tilt your head down ever so slightly, now you're looking through that telescope for a split second so that you can really see things out a little bit farther than, than you're able to see with your standard vision. The, the main thing with bioptics is practice. There's no way that you're gonna put those on and drive a car, okay? <laughs> it takes hours, it takes a lot of practice. And so to be successful with, especially the bioptics, but many of my tools and devices, you really have to put some effort into learning how to use these things successfully. And then after you've shown that you can do it, you have to actually take a driver test and show proficiency to make sure that you, know, that you did put the practice in and you're able to use that successfully. Prisms are another category that's used for driving. Prisms pretty much are successful for people who have double vision. It can also be helpful for people who have lost you know, some area of their visual field from strokes or other injuries or diseases. And so the prism will kind of, it won't give you the vision that's missing, but it'll give you a preview of what's happening in that area so that you can kind of, you know, uh, be prepared for things that are coming. Uh, and lastly, for driving, you want to consider accessories. There's better mirrors. There's high intensity lights. There's voice activated controls. There's knobs, buttons, etc. So if you need to modify your, your automobile, then, then do so. Uh, driving is tied to independence, especially in areas with poor uh, you know, transportation like Orlando, Florida. So my patients really struggle with that. But recently we have the addition of Uber and Lyft and these kind of things. So I, I would say it's, it's not as bad as it has been in the past, right? You have family and friends, of course, but Uber, Lyft is, is a little bit of a, uh, another service that you have available. If you're not having to pay for your car and insurance, you should have a few extra dollars to potentially move around with these. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but I, I do try to make it positive and stay, stay in the positive space and direction. Number five, I want to talk about mobility. This is going to be your white cane, your service animals, all of these kind of things. I've seen many of you using these tools here today, so that, that's fantastic. Yet again, like with driving, practice, practice, practice. I am very sympathetic to the difficulty that is navigating life with vision impairment, but your independence and your confidence moving around is going to come from you practicing with some of these tools. Of course, support from family and friends, but when you, uh, when you use your white cane, you're going to maximize your independence. It's going to give you information about your surroundings. Uh, remember that October 15th is white cane day, so towards the end of the year we've got that. And one of the most important tools in your arsenal, because it's going to give you feedback and, and things about what's in your space. Many of my patients initially are kind of hesitant to put out that white cane. They, they feel the social stigma and the, some of the, the embarrassment of, of having some vision impairment. But I would just tell you that you need the tools that you need to have so that you can be independent, successful, and on your own. Don't worry about the rest of us. Do what you have to do. Uh, and also your cane is for ident identification. You know, one of the things with vis vision impairment is that I, I can't look at you and notice that you don't see what I think you see, all right? If I'm missing an arm, you can pretty much easily tell that I'm missing an arm. But most of my patients still have two pretty looking eyes, and when I look at them, I don't, I don't have a clue how they see me. I just know how I see them. So make sure that you use your identification cane in areas like shopping or areas where you're, you know, not sure about what's happening. Use that to your advantage because generally when you pull out one of those white canes, someone will come to your aid if you're in trouble. 
The guide dog requires proficiency with your white cane first because it's, it's, it's in addition to your cane. It's not going to replace your cane. And guide dogs are excellent at taking you mostly in a straight line so that you're not as distracted with some of the things that you feel with your cane uh, by every obstacle. So the, the dogs are helpful, but yet it, the, everything has a limitation. So you have to have many tools and hopefully you, know, you have to be able to know which, which tool is necessary at what time. Um, the last one for this category are your, your low-powered telescopes used backwards. When you look through a telescope backwards, it might make things a tiny bit smaller with minification, but it widens the field of view. So my patients, especially with, with retinitis pigmentosa, who have you know kind of the tunnel vision going on, it can actually expand your visual field. So if you get inside of a room or a door, you quickly hold the telescope up to your eye, and it kind of gives you a wider field of view and perspective for a split second. So you wouldn't wear this all the time, but it's yet another tool that you have to make that visual field a little bit wider for yourself. All right, next category is gonna be vision rehab. All right, these are experts that are trained to just help you live your life better. Whether it's teaching you techniques, whether it's you know uh, training with the devices that I prescribe, any of these kind of things, uh, learning how to use your white cane, your training with your dog, et cetera, all these things are gonna be done by those vision rehabilitation specialists. Number seven is genetic testing, uh, and make sure that we cover both the DNA side and the mitochondrial. Um, the, the really important reason for genetic testing, uh, especially for your IRDs, is the accuracy of the diagnosis and prognosis. If I don't know exactly what's going on, then maybe I can't give you an exact help, uh, especially for clinical trial opportunities, and also, and most importantly, for family counseling. You know, we have to know if we're going to have children in the future and those kind of things. We want to know what, what's happening and test our partners so that we can make better decisions. Having said that, this is something that can be a little tricky because test results can affect your plan to have children. It can create anxiety. It can create guilt. It can also create resentment and affect relationships with your family members like your parents. So although genetic testing is, I'm, I'm very, you know, a big fan of genetic testing, I, I take a moment to educate my patients that regardless of what the results are, you know, it's, it's strictly a tool for information, not for you to take it to the next level something else. All right, that's kind of the ones that you weren't really thinking about. Now let's get into the real things that are kind of more low vision-y. Number one, first and foremost, I am an optometrist, so number one is gonna be eyeglasses. Eyeglasses are gonna fix your refractive error, your prescription, and it's very important because uh, for most of the aids and devices to be successful, you have to have the clearest vision possible. If you have a lot of astigmatism, for example, and I give you a telescope or a microscope, none of these things work. We have to correct that astigmatism first so that things are as clear as possible and then I can make things bigger or closer or whatever is the case. All right. Um, high plus readers with prism. Does anybody know why the prisms are necessary when, when you're high, high you know, plus prescriptions? Well, when you hold something very close to your face, your eyes have to cross. And if you've ever tried to look at your nose and cross your eyes, that kind of hurts. So the prism is there to reduce the effects of having to cross your eyes. Uh, I know the glasses are very ugly. They're gonna be very thick in the middle compared to the edges, right? But the purpose of that is when you're holding things very close, your eyes eyes don't have to work as hard to cross and, and relieve some of that stress. Now, standard prism can also be used, like I said earlier, for double vision, for field expansion, for these kind of things. Um, then there's the contrast filters. I'm sure everybody's tried the yellow glasses, the FL41 filters. I like all the colors. It's amazing that trying different colors will sometimes actually achieve some success. The most popular being your yellows and your FL41s, but there's plenty of colors. Uh, for example, migraines can use blue, blue filters as an example. And of course, again, the sun. The sun is very powerful and we want to protect, so have some good sunglasses that are polarized. 
But then again, I have some patients whose vision is a little bit less, and if you put some dark sunglasses, it actually makes it worse. So what's neat is that we can you know, control how dark that lens needs to be. So you just have to communicate with your doctor. On the other extreme, I have people who don't drive and are extremely sensitive to lights. So I can make some sunglasses that are almost like welding goggles, and that person is com almost completely protected from light altogether. So again, go light, go dark, go in the middle, go gradient where it's darker at the top lighter at the bottom we just we have a lot of options as far as the eyeglasses space next one is kind of one of my favorites as well it's going to be contact lenses contact lenses is another way to correct your refractive error but instead of it floating in front of your eyes on a pair of glasses now you're able to put that on the surface of your eye refractive uh, error is actually on the surface of the eye so putting a contact lens is actually correcting the problem where the problem exists not floating in front of your eyes anywhere okay there's conditions like keratoconus that makes the eye pointy and doesn't allow light to focus where it needs to focus on that macula. So there's uh, um, patients with those conditions actually don't even perform with eyeglasses. The eyeglasses cause things to scatter because the light is affected by the space of air between your eye, uh, eyes and the glasses. There is no sleeping in contact lenses. Although some lenses are approved by the FDA for what's called extended wear or sleeping, I have found that the patients who come in with issues are generally the ones who do two things. They sleep in their contacts and they don't replace them properly. So making sure that you take your lenses off at the end of the day and replacing them on their proper schedule is going to be critical. Soft contact lenses are very easy to use. They're convenient, affordable, and most everybody is familiar with those. Maybe if you're older and you had some bad prescription, you would know about hard lenses, the RGPs, the rigid gas permeables. And now recently, we've been able to do scleral lenses, which are kind of a shield, all right? These lenses are designed to vault. They don't touch that sensitive cornea. And the space between the lens and the cornea is filled with saline. So now it becomes a part of your eye and and it maximizes that, that visual system to the best possible way. I have taken people from legal blindness to 2020 with scleral lenses. It's amazing. I have a patient who is 46 years old, and she came in not wanting to come in because she's seen 15,000 doctors, and nobody had been able to help. I have these trials in my office. I put two pairs, one in each eye, and that woman cried for 30 minutes. It was amazing. So they're very rewarding when, when they're necessary, right? But I want you to know that contact lenses are part of the solution. The last one that I want you to know about are your painted or custom co uh, contact lenses. These are lenses that I use for my albino patients. If, if you know a little bit about albinism, their iris is kind of semi-transparent. The purpose of the iris is to control the amount of light that gets into the eye. So if that iris is semi-transparent, they are bombarded with extra light and they're always squinting and they're always affected by lights. So we can actually create either a soft or a hard lens. It's painted by hand to match your color, or you can make whatever color you want. You can even do Halloween type of all black, all white, whatever you want. But these lenses are available to really support those patients, cut out some of that excess additional light that can make vision a lot more complicated for them. All right. The last thing I'll say about contact lenses is that for most every one of them, glasses are mandatory as a backup. We have to use glasses before we put the lenses in. We have to use glasses after we take them out because I said no sleeping. And let's say you break or lose a lens, then, then what do you do? So most of my patients have to have some backup glasses. There are examples like the patient that I said earlier who does not correct with eyeglasses and has to wear these scleral lenses. But the grand and majority should have a backup pair of glasses. The day-to-day -day items, the miscellaneous, there are so many. I'm not going to waste too much time on this. If you flip through the LSS catalog or the MaxiAids catalogs, that's pretty much what we're talking. You want things that talk to you. You want kitchen aids. You want pens to write, signature and writing guides, money brailers. You have a question, sir? No. I'm so sorry. Um, amplified home telephones, entertainment things like playing cards and dominoes, uh, large print products. There's so many different things out there. And again, it, there's not a one 
one size fits all. You have to decide what you need and then go find a solution to these things. The next one's gonna be electronic devices. These have become very powerful. Your iPhone in your pocket or your Android phone in your pocket does a lot of things, but we just, just have to learn how to accomplish those things, all right? If you're using a lot of computer, you wanna think about getting a large high definition screen. We all know size matters, and so <laughs> the bigger the screen, the more you can see, especially when you do magnification, because now everything gets bigger, and so instead of seeing one or two letters, you can see words or sentences. Number two for computers are your high contrast uh, keyboards. They can be either you know yellow uh, black letters on yellow background or white, and they're high contrast, high uh, large size, so that if you need to look down and look at the keys, that will help with that. You want to make sure you learn the touch and voice commands. You know, sometimes pressing the buttons on the side will do some certain tasks. You can talk to Siri or Alexa and, and have things done on your behalf. You can ask them the time or the weather definition of, you know, uh, uh, any words or anything that you're having trouble with. So very powerful device that has a, a lot of um, uh, intelligence in there. Your Bluetooth devices, the, that's kind of a newer one. You can control the thermostat for your temperature at the house. You can get a microwave and just talk to it. You can you know, do things like that, lights, turn lights on and off with voice. So if, if you need these things in your home, make sure you just go out there and, and purchase some of these items, okay? Then there's JAWS, Zoom Text, iZoom. These are computer magnifiers that will make the screen bigger, change the contrast. So if you needed some support with your electronic device, Devices, that's pretty much what we're talking about. The Apple products tend to have these built in. You might have to buy some of these products if you're using Windows or Android products. Uh, yeah, please. Do I need to use a mic or? Uh, let's see. Got one here. Good morning. I just wanted to add, um, for Windows in particular, uh, a lot of the assistive devices, such as a built-in screen reader and such, are now available. Um, so just wanted to Absolutely. update that piece. Thank you. Thank you. We've got another question back there in the back, please. Hi, something else I actually just wanted to add. Um, so one of the great things about some of these uh, new uh, updates for the operating systems is they have something called dark mode, which is built throughout the system where it's a black background and white text. The problem that I was facing until recently is that when you go on the web browser, all the content, a lot of it is still white background and then black text. And I found something in Google Chrome where you can cha it changes all the content on the web to be dark background and white text automatically. It is absolutely incredible. So if anyone wants to know how to do that, um, find me or talk to me. I can show you how to do it. It has changed my work and personal life completely. Excellent. Excellent. And there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you could just hold any questions, um, we'll be doing that towards the end, and we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. Perfect. Um, so Braille devices would be the next category. Oh, before I get into Braille, uh, one of the last things to note on your electronics, your computers, and things like that is that you can comp uh, you can connect these things by Bluetooth to a smart TV or a smart computer, and now you can really make things a lot bigger as well. So, and that's wireless without any cables or anything like that. So, using Bluetooth is a pretty pretty cool feature as well. The Braille devices, uh, you've got this, the displays and note takers. Quite honestly, I'm, I'm not very experienced with these devices. Uh, the good majority of my low vision patients um, are senior and acquired their vision, vision impairment later in life. And so although I present Braille as an option for all of my patients, because it is a tool and, a, and, and an option for them, most are not really prepared to, to learn this new skill and put the time in. But certainly with the accessibilities that are now being presented, I'm not going to say that Braille is obsolete, but again, it's just something new that you have to learn, but, but it is an option that we have out there. If you already know Braille, then chances are you've, you've experienced vision impairment for a long time and, and you've been successful to learn that in school, or, but, but like re learning to read, everything requires practice. Okay. Uh, distance vision. So what are some of the aids to, to achieve far away vision? 
as I mentioned earlier, your eyeglasses or your contact lenses, the refraction error is always going to be the first step. Um, because when things are as clear as I can make them, then we can make things bigger or closer as necessary. Uh, one of the newest things are the smart glasses. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the new Ray-Bans, but these Ray-Bans have little video cameras on the front and they connect to your phone with Bluetooth, which means you can answer your phone, you can take video and uh, 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 pictures with, with, without having to pull out your phone and it's on your face already. What's even cooler than that is just like the Envision glasses or some of the apps where you can call a friend if you're having an emergency or if you're lost or having some difficulty, now you can use the video cameras on those glasses when you make a phone call and do a video conference and now whoever you're calling can see what you're looking at and can support you if there was some, you know, some emergency or some safety issues that you're encountering at that time. So basically we just call a friend and they're seeing what you're, what you're seeing and they can help help guide you through that process. So I, I've been starting to use the smart glasses for low vision, even though they're kind of a cool item. I think they're going to be helpful as well. Um, your binoculars and your monoculars, these are little gadgets that obviously bring far away distance things much closer. Generally, the power on these is a little strong, so you wouldn't wear it all the time. But for spotting, for looking across uh, the street, looking at your neighbor, looking at the birds, uh, anything like this that you want to see that's very far away, these things are going to bring it closer to you. Binoculars are generally the best because it makes use of both of your eyes. But monoculars are very convenient because they fit in your pocket and they're kind of easier to carry. So you just have to decide which way you want to go. There's no right and wrong. It just they both work well. There are some spectacle mounted there are some spectacle mounted ones as well. And so you can get that mounted on there. Uh, for near vision, you've got the bifocals, you've got progressive lenses, you want to make sure you use a lot of light, and if not a lot of light, at least control the lighting to what your preference is. There's millions of lens options as far as little magnifiers, pocket, stand, all types of different you know optical lens magnifiers, but the newer product, products are all kind of video. Um, there's a, a, a plenty of, of video devices, anywhere from three and a half to 22 inch screens uh, like a CCTV and these were going to allow to make small print larger so you can appreciate it. Two more categories and then we can get into some cases, okay? Enough with the talkie talkie. The next one is the augmented reality and virtual reality. These sound amazing, but I, I haven't had as much success as I expected to have with these, to be very honest with you. I think that the technology on these devices is a little bit behind uh, some of your cell phones and some of these other technologies, so I'm a little disappointed in them. But However, when they work, they're amazing. There's a bunch of them. There's the Patriot. There's the Ace Sight. There's the Iris Vision, the Inspire, the Idaptic, the New Eye. There's so many of these virtual reality kind of goggle systems. Systems. Um, again, try them out, and if it works, fantastic, but I, I have found that they're not kind of awesome for everybody. The new Apple Vision Pro. These things are amazing. I went to the store, I got a demonstration, and I was very impressed. But then when I sent some of my patients to get a demonstration, we quickly realized that you have to have eye tracking. The way the device works is it uses your eye movements as your mouse, so that if you wanted to click something on the top left, you actually have to look at it with your eyes, and et cetera. Your, your eyes are your mouse. And so some of my patients, unfortunately, did not have some success with the eye tracking, and the device didn't work at all. So just keep that in mind. Last category is your artificial intelligence. This is going to be your products like the OrCam or the Envision glasses. Uh, the OrCam products are great. They're a quick point and shoot and reads to you type of thing. The one that you wear on your glasses, the My Eye, will actually recognize people's faces just like the Envision does. Uh, and it'll, they, they've become smarter so that you're using artificial intelligence to ask questions. For example, you take a picture of this room. If I'm standing up here, it might say there's a crowd of people in front of you, some speakers, a podium, a table and it'll tell you these little quick data information points so that you can you know make use of the the space in front of you they can tell time and uh, you can talk to them recognize faces etc 
uh, the new OrCam products, you can now actually connect it to your, your television or your, uh, or your computer, and it'll serve as a, uh, like a portable CCTV as well. But you do need a, a window, uh, you need, do need Wi-Fi uh, uh, accessibility so that it can do the artificial intelligence for you. And then, of course, the applications you can download. You know, there's my favorite is Seeing AI. If you don't have Seeing AI, make sure you download it and speak to Matt uh, upstairs. Upstairs, he's uh, with Microsoft. They've developed this application. I think it's fantastic. He even showed me that the new feature you can, for example, take a picture of this water bottle, and if I drop it, the phone will actually help me locate that that item without it having a pot or anything like that. So I, I think it's very powerful. Um, let's see. Is that just an app? Or? That is an app. It's an app on your phone. I think they just recently added it to Android as well. Initially, it was only iPhone. Uh, but yes, it is, it is an application, and it's free. That's the best part. It's free. Seeing. seeing, like to see. Seeing AI. Artificial intelligence. AI. Um, so that's pretty much it for, for the low vision devices categories. I kind of had the idea to do these cases with, with patients, but if you have a lot of questions, I want to make sure I address those first. So let's do the questions part first, and then we can talk about some cases. Go ahead, Dan, please. Yes, mainly I want to say thanks, Dr. Richardson, for coming to Visions. Uh, I'm Dan Day from Orlando. I'm the chapter president down there. And I met Dr. Richardson at Visions 2022, uh, met him at the, the lunch in the exhibit hall on a Saturday. Uh, and he, uh, to his credit, took the initiative, has become a great partner. Uh, with FFB and our, particularly down there in Orlando, he's been at our speaker series and has talked there before. So you can see why we invited him now, I think, to come. And I say invited him, he actually took the initiative to to contact me a couple months ago and say, what do I, who do I talk to about maybe presenting at Visions? Um, and uh, I think, is Michelle Glaze in the room by any chance? No. I don't think so. Okay. Um, but Michelle Glaze, if you don't know her name, she's the director of professional outreach. But I know she did some lobbying to get um, low vision added to, to the visions conferences. We, I don't think at the FFB we've put a lot of emphasis on low vision before. But I think I'm real pleased to see that we kind of have standing room only here. Mm -hmm. I think this is proof positive that it's a topic we want to keep. Um, but and, and as many of you or some of you may know, we just produced, uh, FFB just created a video a couple months ago called Best Clinical Practices for Patients with retinal disease, uh, we had both a, uh, a retina specialist, Dr. Um, Rachel Huckfeld, who you've heard speak before at Visions, and uh, Dr. Rochelle Lynn, who's a low vision specialist, uh, talk on that best clinical practices. And I can say with confidence, having been examined by Dr. Richardson here in <laughs> early May, uh, Dr. Richardson checks off all the boxes for best clinical practices. This is what Passed. vision specialty should should say. So I, I want to thank you for coming more than Thanks, Dan. Else. I appreciate it for the invitation. Like I said, a thank you. Some questions here in the back as well. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Sandy. Thank you for being here. I have a question regarding um, the new LED lighting that's everywhere. Um, I have a real glare problem. Yeah. Um, I have a guide dog, so when I go places, I have to bring my prism sunglasses, my prism glasses, mm -hmm. and my sunglasses. And I'm starting to wonder: is I've had cataract surgery years ago. Is there some kind of contact? that I can put on that maybe doesn't correct my vision, but maybe I can put on in the morning that would, when I go places or when I, I live in Florida as well, mm -hmm. that even in my house that can cut glare, c cut blue light from the LED lights, like when I go to Publix or, sure. it's not as bad in here, but some stores just absolutely kill me. I yeah. mean, <laughs> You're, you're very, you're not unique. A lot of my patients. <laughs> I, my daughter doesn't have any eye disease, and she's like, this is driving her crazy. But I wondered, is there something other than carrying a third pair of glasses with me um, that I can put, like I said, put on my eyes? Mm -hmm. 
There, there's no Stop easy this. solution, but <laughs> the same colored contacts that I presented earlier would be a potential option. With that colored contact, I can control the size of the pupil so that I can make the pupil a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger. Um, there's also some contact lenses that were initially designed for athletes, for professional athletes. These are actually a tinted contact lens so that when they're playing baseball and look up to catch the ball, as an example, they would have some, you know, uh, some some support from that. These are not very common, and and one of the things that I really enjoy doing is listening to people and creatively finding solutions. So you're going to just have to find a doctor or come see me in Florida, and we can try some of these. We can try some of these contact lenses. But as I said, most all of the things I do is a trial and error. Just when I thought I had the perfect solution, it fails. Just when I thought, man, this is a waste of time, the patient and says, oh, that changed my life. So I, I really don't know exactly until we try some of these things and you say, wow, that worked, or let's try something else. Yeah, I live in St. Augustine. Yeah, not too far. So, and even when I walk out of my living room, I, you know, it's just so bright. Yeah. I'm from the rest of the family, but uh, I don't also want to walk around in sunglasses because then I can't see right. anything else. But that's exactly what I was going to say is the small drawback of these contacts. If I put the lens on your eye, now if you go in a dim or a low light environment, you may have problems and you might have to take the lens out. And that's why I mean there's no 100% solution. So if you know you're going to be outside for a long time, then maybe that's the option. If you're in and out, kind of like in, in, in a conference or something like that, it just might not be viable. But another tool in your arsenal to use as needed. Yeah, I just wondered if it was like some, you know, some of those things that block out blue light or whatever like that. You know? I I mean, I'm sure you've tried yellow and blue blockers and all this. So if, if those aren't working, then, you know, if, if you control the space, you can just go in there and modify the lights. I've had some people uh, at their job just literally take a piece of paper and, you know, with tape, tape it over the, the light source, and that just dulls it enough for them to be successful. So uh, I know it's tricky. Lighting is a tough one. I think it's a tough one. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, when you started, uh, you said you had three categories. I stopped counting at 42. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so I had kind of two categories, the eight basics and then the 16 long ones. So, yeah, sorry to make you confused there. I'll take the numbers out next time. <laughs> um, but I do have two questions. One is kind of related. It's about the um, contrast glasses you were talking about. I've been having a lot of issues with contrast. Um, I started using dark mode like that gentleman said. So I just wanted to know if there's like glasses to help with that. Um, glasses for what exactly? I'm sorry. Contrast. I heard you well, say something contrast. about contrast glasses. Yes. Again, you would have to try different colors until it achieves the contrast that you're looking for. Okay. What's difficult is that not all written material is black on white. Sometimes you have brown on brown, and sometimes you have yellow. And so, depending on the different color of the text or the paper, you might find that different colored filters are appropriate. So, yet again, you can't have just yellow. You might have to have yellow and amber and F. 41 and blue and so you may have to have multiple tools depending on what you're looking at as far as something better uh, sometimes you can go to the craft store and get these sheets of color and that way instead of putting it on your face you can just lay it on top of the material um, yeah, but it's it's about maximizing that contrast it's a tough one it's a tough one All right, just a quick follow-up um, you had said something about NAC 16 or NAC 32 regarding RP. So um, there's uh, for RP, it's your NAC, NAC. NAC stands for N-acetylcysteine. Uh, da, 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 let me go back up there and look for that. <laughs> yeah. So N-acetylcysteine for RP, it prevents the oxidative stress. Uh, it's been a 45-month study with over 400 patients. Uh, and, and again, but the second one was NAC-amide, N-A-C-A, NACA, NAC-amide. This is for patients with Usher syndrome, and it's designed to be even more potent and bioavailable, and it's currently in, in stage two, or phase two clinical trials. NACA? N-A-C-A, NACA. Yeah, of course. Yes, please, in the back. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Doc, for doing this. Really helpful for all of us. So I had a very quick question. So I have RP. Uh-huh. 
and also strabismus. I see that a unique combination. Uh, so I'm looking for any any advice you can give for driving, especially in the rain at night. That's where I have the the biggest problem, right? And so because of the rain, everything is a glare. The whole lane sometimes appears to be just one big road for me. So. Yeah, so that's so not, not to be cruel, but probably stop and wait. I mean, that that is a difficult environment, even for someone with absolutely perfect 2015 vision. They still have accidents, and you add fog and low light and these kind of things. Those are just tricky environments. At that point, I would probably say for safety reason, your con best consideration would be to wait. Wait till the storm passes. I know it's not convenient for you. I apologize. But safety is the number one consideration. You, you have a three to 4,000 pound projectile and either you hurt yourself or you can hurt someone else so it, it's really important to be mature and make some good decisions about these kind of things yeah, I'm, I'm doing that and last question is progressives right because i have strabismus do you recommend progressives i mean it's just really tough to adjust to progressives Pro progressives is is a good conversation Pro progressive lenses are the no line bifocals uh, and they're very successful generally for patients who've worn them before if i have a patient who's never worn them before and they're coming in for low vision, I generally never recommend progressives. I would either do a lined old school bifocal or two pair, one for your far vision and one for your reading vision. That, that's more of a comfort thing. Now, is your strabismic eye seeing as well as the other eye? So, I mean, there is, again, alignment surgery to speak with one of your surgeons and see if, if that's a viable option that they recommend. Um, uh, so that, that would give you more of a stereopsis. It would give you more depth perception type of a thing. Um, and, and you're meeting your driving standards even with RP? Yeah, yeah. Very good. So then your vision is very good. I mean, a lot of my RP... Good, good. That's great. Maybe, again, maybe a bioptic telescope for you, maybe some of these other tools, uh, uh, but, but maybe eye alignment might be something, and potentially for driving, just distance glasses. Do you feel like you need to see the speedometer or anything else? No. So to, to have less distraction in your vision, maybe just a distance driving glasses. And you can use those for TV, the movie theater. They have multiple use, but it sounds like for you, the driving might be the best way there. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Max, and I have uh, Stargard. Uh, and I kind of pro user of mm, different low vision devices, sure. uh, from uh, assistive functions of my phone or PC to video magnifier. And my question um, is kind of tricky, <laughs> it might be strange. It's my favorite. Oh, yeah. Uh, so. If we imagine that um, therapy for every disease, for every um, mutation uh, comes out, do we, st do we still need uh, those devices, glasses, um, and or any gadgets? So what do you think about it? Thank you. Well, so if, if these therapies will bring back your vision to function to full function and achieving driving and these kind of things, then no, throw your devices away. I don't, I don't think they're necessary. Nobody uses those because they're awesome. You use them, be you use them because you have to, right? So I, I would just say that, yeah, if, if, if these therapies, however, most of these therapies have not gotten to the level where it takes you from, you know, legal blindness or severe impairment to, to real functional with just glasses or contact lenses. I, I have not found that any of these therapies are getting there. Now, there is a lot of hope, and a lot of it depends on how much vision has been lost. I, I don't think that the regeneration is easy because it takes time, right? To regenerate a cell might take a couple of years, and so to or regenerate many cells is going to take, you know, dozens of years, et cetera. But so depending on how much functional vision you have combined, with some of these new technologies, maybe you're going to be okay. But as, as vision starts to get a little harder and a little worse, we're not so good at bringing things back. We're really good at conserving and kind of maintaining. If that, I'm, I'm not trying to pop your bubble. I'm, I'm so sorry. I know that the hope is that we can fix these things and we're moving in that direction. And I think that's what this particular organization, the foundation, does the very best is going out there to try to resolve these things for you guys. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes. Okay. I have a question here in the back. One second, ladies. He'll come back up. 
Yes, please. Okay. Hi, my name is Susan Hedrick, and I have RP. I'm from Springfield, Virginia. What type of equipment would you recommend for a color identifier, like Ooh. clothes? I, I'm always running around Yikes. trying to find something, and I'm, I gotcha. ask my husband. Sometimes I run out the door, and I ask, do I match? <laughs> I, I have a friend, Mr. Dan, would like to key in on that. So here, let me pass the microphone to Dan. <laughs> He was very anxious to answer this one. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I, I know a lot of you know about this app already. It's called Be My Eyes. But it, it, there's a relatively new component. It's been there a while called Be My AI for artificial intelligence. It's the best color discriminator I have found so far. Yeah, I use it like when I was coming to this conference, I got a black sweater, a navy sweater, and I can't tell the difference between the two. But it had no problem not only when it took the picture described a black navy sweater with ribbed, a ribbed hem and you know all this sort of thing. It also noticed the tag and said it looks like it's from Land's End and I'm thinking, wow, I was standing six feet back and you <laughs> read the tag. <laughs> so I would recommend, and it's a free app, so available Android and iOS, so download it and uh, if you haven't been, from, if you're not familiar with Be My Eyes, highly recommend you get that and try out the Be My AI uh, component that's inside there. Oh, I want to mention too, uh, Dr. Richardson focused on the mental health aspect. That's kind of a new focus area too for the foundation. We're paying more attention to it, and you, I'm sure you saw it on the uh, the, uh, the itinerary. But this afternoon at 1:15 in Salon One and Two is dedicated to the mental health aspect. So I, it really I think will be an in, informative session. So thanks, Doctor. Appreciate that. I think the, the, the cell phone cameras are very sensitive. Yes. The lights that would, yes. You couldn't see the naked eye, but if you take a picture, they would see all the colors. Yes. Yeah. There, there is also a, a, other other tools. I mean, you could potentially use a labeler. You know, there's these little labels that you can put on fabric or you can stick to a bottle or a can or anything, and then you can give it a voice label. So you can hide the little tag inside your clothes somewhere, and then you just scan it with the little scanner, and it'll remind you what you tagged it. So you either use an application or a labeler or, or uh, hey, a friend. <laughs> hey, a question. Uh, my son has Stargardt's, and... Uh, obviously maximizing his peripheral vision um, is a great thing to do. Is there like training on how to maximize using your peripheral vision? Sure, sure. I mean, your occupational therapists are going to get into uh, an optometrist as well. Um, peripheral vision is tough, right? As I mentioned earlier with these um, prism devices for, for field loss, it generally just gives you a gives you a What's the word? Gives you like a just a taste of what's coming. It's not going to give you that vision per se, but it gives you an early warning. For example, you know if you've lost entire vision to your left side, then reading you can kind of see where the text starts and ends, and you can do that. For driving, you can see things coming out from your left side a little bit sooner than you would have otherwise. But with Stargardt's, it's a tough case because it's an island of vision, and most of the times it's not centered. And if it's not centered and you have two eyes, now the brain is seeing two different images and that just, it's its a difficult, it's very difficult. For that, a lot of training, practice and patience, you know, using a lot of the tools like your your canes and your dogs and these kind of things for that. that that's a tough one, it's a tough one. So is that an both, you know, your, your optometrist is going to go more from the medical side and look at some of these devices and prisms if they apply, but yet then your therapist is going to spend time with you outside walking and doing these things so that you can s practice and feel what it's like to, to, you know, do those adjustments in your life. That's a tough one. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Kirill. I have quite connected question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned many, many different uh, technologies to uh, help with uh, vision loss. Uh, optics, CCTV, apps, and so on and so on. Sure. Uh, is it you, you have everything by your own or you have dedicated team? If I ah. I'm all just optometrist mm -hmm. or special team. So I, what, what I have, the reason I got into low vision is because I was tired of telling my patients that I had nothing for them. And so about eight or nine years ago, I went to one of the vendors, Eschenbach, one of the biggest low vision vendors, and I bought like $30,000 worth of equipment. And then I kind of sat there and did, well, what do I do now? <laughs> 
And so I have taken a slightly different approach. A lot of your low vision doctors are very by the book. They're very, uh, they do a lot of measurements. They do a lot of things like that. I, I take more of a functional approach. I really like to, what I call, listen, you know, and try to correct, you know. So whatever your problems, your concerns, your issues are, I try to go at them very specifically because, again, there is no one device that does it all. And so when you ask me how I put all this together, it's just been trial and error, to be honest with you. I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm low vision trained. We re, All optometrists receive a little bit of low vision at school. And I would say that ophthalmology is also trained. But, but the focus for a standard optometrist and standard ophthalmologist doesn't provide enough time to do the services that you will require. I spend over 45 minutes with each one of my patients. And so <laughs> you have to be creative with billing. You have to be creative with insurance. You have to be efficient with the time so that you don't waste people's time. So I guess to indirectly answer your question, I've just come up with my own, my own method as I've gone along. And I've been very successful because I worry about function. I don't care about calculations. Oh, you need a 6X versus a 4X. I don't care about those things. I can give you both of those, and you can tell me which one works better. And that's we're done. So, so function for me is my main, main priority. Uh, having said that, I'm in the process of establishing a new system so that I can put low vision in the doctor, in the retina doctor's office. Because in my perspective, all of you patients have a retina doctor but you won't necessarily have an optometrist or a low vision or something like this. And since that ophthalmology is overwhelmed with 50, 60 patients in a day, don't expect them to do low vision for you. It's not going to happen. So I want to design a way that I can virtually or by phone or video conferencing support you guys, my patients, with, with these technologies no matter where you're at. You want to be in Timbuktu or you want to be in Germany, I don't, I don't care. I've got patients from all over the world that I've been able to support just by doing some video conferencing. Did that answer your question, sir? Um, well, come to Florida. Bring your family to Disney. I mean, if you have kids especially, Disney is the place you go. It's happy and sad because it's expensive. We have about five minutes remaining, so we only have time for one or two more questions. Um, my name is Artemis. I have Stoggarts, and I wanted to share some of my tricks of driving with biopsies. Sure. Um, I use a talking clock because okay. I can't spend the time looking at the clock on sure. the dashboard, so I have a talking clock in the car. And the other thing that I do is I leave the windows slightly open so that I can hear the traffic, and it basically supports what I'm seeing in my two side mirrors. Very good. Um, the other thing I wanted to suggest to the mother of another Stoggarts person, the exercises that I did... Um, it, I got diagnosed when I was 17. So exercises that I started doing back in my 20s and I still do today mm -hmm. is the Bates eye exercises. And it, I know it's just for regular, you know, for regular vision and you're supposed to be able to throw your glasses away. That wasn't anything I ever thought was going to happen. But it does strengthen my eye and I always feel like I can see just a little bit better after I've done it. Excellent. I'm not too familiar with the Bates. I'll have to look at that one. It's a book on Amazon. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I two questions. One is I recent I have low vision. It's a, a gene abnormality, G G U C Y two D. I've had low vision my whole life. Glasses before I could walk. I recently had my cataracts removed because my world was gray. And mm -hmm. I kept telling my retinal doctor, you say my eyes are the same, but they're not the same. So right. he measured and they're gone. It has been very difficult adjustment. Oh. And I don't know. Too much light. Well, <laughs> maybe too much light, but I've lost my ability. I used to be able to look at something here, oh. like four inches from my face, and I could see it great, but that is gone. And I don't know if that's something that other people experience or so, it's a real shock for me. None of my doctors, I have good people that my, I see. My initial guess would be that you are nearsighted. Very nearsighted. And so when you're nearsighted, Incredibly. you call it how you see it. You can see up close. Yeah. When I take the cataracts out, and if we don't have a conversation with that surgeon ahead of time, they set you up for far vision. So you lose the privilege of your reading. That was, it's not that it was on purpose, it's just that oh, we no. didn't communicate. No, of course not. I told her my goal was to be able to read books to my granddaughter. Yeah. But I don't think that she had 
being as we just met once, a perception of how darn nearsighted I was. I, I, I don't so think here I, I am. I don't think I have taken that into consideration before, and I'll be more more careful with my patients in the future. But yeah. that's a very good point. Uh, I, many of you are nearsighted, and you know when you take your glasses off, things up close are really good and easy, right? The moment you put your glasses on or a bifocal, it's good, but not as good. The God gave you this vision. I can't make it any better with glasses. So the, the up close is, is going to be as good as you can. When you take a, a cataract lens out, we generally, most ophthalmologists, will set up that prescription to be no prescription so that we maximize your far vision. <laughs> but if in your case the far vision wasn't going to be so good, then perhaps a waiver that says, look, I'm choosing a different route. I know you generally make it for far away, but in my case, I want to conserve my reading. And then we put in some reading lenses. And But it, it would probably be a waiver where you have to kind of say, hey, I, I've done this on purpose and <laughs> because it's, it's out of the ordinary. But that's what we have to do. Out of the ordinary is what we have to do to be successful. Whatever it takes is what I say. Whatever it takes. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. I, I mean, I had a good understanding, but I just don't think people are aware. Right. Uh, again, when you're nearsighted, you see up close. You can't see far. So when, when we take that cataract out and we set you for far, you lost that benefit that you've had your whole life. And, and yeah. it was just something that was not... Again, you're right. Cataract surgeons meet you twice, the first time to see you and the second time to do the surgery. So <laughs> it's kind of tough. They don't know the case history. They don't know you personally. They, they weren't asking the right questions. Well, or I didn't share. I just, I had no idea what to expect. It would be out of the ordinary. Not many patients are put, you know, left with lenses for reading. That, that would be a special case. But if that's what you want, then you should get what you want. That's how I feel about it. And I think Dr. Richardson already mentioned Matt Filipinko, who's working at the Microsoft booth in right. the right. Pace. Right. He is great. He has Stargardt, and he was able to help one of our new employees with a lot of tips and tricks and for sure. apps that. Uh, no, the electronics are powerful. I, I challenge you to learn the most you can on how to use these devices. And if you need a large screen, just get an iPad yeah. or a tablet so that use your phone for phone calls and your tablet or iPad for everything else. iPads have almost replaced computers they're so powerful unless you're an engineer or you need a particular application on, on your com powerful computer you can get away with doing everything on an iPad and so that, that's a it's a wonderful thing I think I've run out of time but I'd love to answer any more questions if you want to meet me outside and you have further questions I'd love to help okay thank you